welcome to Linux Action News, our weekly take on Linux and the open source world. This is episode 8, recorded on July 2nd, 2017, and I'm Chris. And I'm Joe. Hello, Joe. We have a great lineup of news and finally some details on the story we covered towards the very beginning of this show. OpenSUSE and SUSE Linux Enterprise have hit the Windows Store. Yeah, I said the Windows Store. Yeah, so the Windows subsystem for Linux is now not just Ubuntu officially. Now you've got OpenSUSE and SUSE Linux Enterprise, which totally makes sense, doesn't it? Because this is really aimed at developers and people and, you know, sysadmins, that kind of thing. So you're going to expect it to be the more um, corporate distros. So I'm just waiting for RHEL, which we haven't got any word on yet. Fedora is supposed to be coming soon. But it would, I think it would make a lot of sense to get, well, at least CentOS on there. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking that. I wonder if the project could take that on or if Microsoft could help them. Definitely, a SUSE Enterprise Server is, that clicks for me. That makes a lot of sense. And you will need to be a member of the Windows Insider program to get this. I think you have to be running Preview Build uh, 16, 190, or later to get this. And also, just a caveat, I think this is prob- maybe it'll be fixed by the time this episode goes out. But uh, in the Windows Store, there are screenshots of the X desktop for SUSE. <laughs> yeah, which is confusing, isn't it? <laughs> no, you don't get that. You get Bash when you install SUSE. And you still also have to first install the Linux subsystem. But, you know, a couple of quick things. You can, you can sign up for the Insider program pretty quickly, and then you could match your production now on your Windows 10 box. That's, that's going to matter for a lot of people. Yeah, and you can, of course, hack it so you can install uh, X yeah. server and stuff and, and make it work, but that's not officially supported. Yeah, well, I, I suppose uh, it, that would almost be worth me loading a Windows 10 machine just to mess around with, because I remember the days of Sigwin, Joe, and they, this, is a, this is a whole other breed. It's, I actually am really impressed with what Microsoft is doing here. and It's cool to see SUSE actually get it in there. I was a little surprised it took publishing to the Windows Store for us to really find out what versions of SUSE we get to try, but now we know. Yeah, especially as I actually spoke to Richard about this, Richard Brown, the chairman of OpenSUSE, and still he didn't know, and that was maybe three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Right. So I I don't really understand why it's happened like this, but, well, here we are, we've got them both, so just wait for Fedora and uh, and maybe Arch at one point, but uh, I'm not holding my breath for that. I wouldn't hold my breath for Pop! OS either. That's System 76's new operating system. Don't call it a distribution. They announced it this week. Pop! OS based on Ubuntu 17.04 using the GNOME desktop environment. You mean Pop! exclamation mark underscore OS? Yes, I do. <laughs> it's kind of hard to say that. I'm not sure. And I'm not sure if the acronym is supposed to be POS or what, or if it's just Pop. It might Maybe it's just supposed to be Pop. Those are all things we haven't learned yet because we're all too busy trying to figure out what just happened. Well, I think there's quite a few people who think it's a POS, but uh, let's not go there, eh? You know, I've, I've, so I've been trying to figure out how do people generally feel about this, and I'm honestly getting the sense from System76's own customer base, their existing base, they seem kind of fired up about this. Now, people outside of that ecosystem seem to be extremely skeptical. Yeah, it's skeptical to say the least, really. I've seen a lot of negativity on Reddit, in the Telegram channels. It just seems that the, the the wider community, as you say, are not. They, they just they keep asking the question, "Why?" You guys were talking about this on um, user error, and it just keeps coming back to that question: "Why? Why have they done this?" But I suppose, yeah, the the, the only positivity I've seen is yeah from the existing System seventy six community, not from the wider Linux community, because it just the the wider community sees this as duplicated effort because they've based it on Ubuntu and right now we've got this alpha which is based on Ubuntu GNOME 1704 and really apart from a theme and some extensions there's not really much to differentiate it yeah not yet uh I would be interested to see if they eventually deviate in like release cadence and uh pre-installed software more and more there's also the question if they're going to become an official Ubuntu flavor And I think that's a pretty important question. There's a big trademark issue lingering here now because they're using the Ubuntu repos and a lot of the software packages that are being installed have Ubuntu in the name, Ubuntu in some of the uh, build notes. That could lead to a potential trademark issue, something that Mint is somewhat familiar with, especially because they'll be using the same repos, where if they become a flavor, 
it essentially resolves these issues, plus they get popped into the support infrastructure for the other Ubuntu flavors. But it's not clear to me exactly what restrictions would be placed on them by becoming an official flavor. Well, I think that that is La La Land dream thinking, really. It's it's not going to happen. I can't see that Canonical would be willing to even entertain the idea because it's too similar. All of the other flavors have something that differentiates them, whether it's an XFCE or Mate desktop or whatever. But if you've just got a GNOME desktop with a different theme, how is that different enough to warrant it being a flavor? There, there just seems no way that that's going to happen to me. To tell you the truth, Joe, if I was Carl at System76, I'd probably be willing to make some concessions to become an official flavor. If they don't, they're going to end up in a situation, I believe, where they're going to have to offer both OS choices at purchase time, Ubuntu LTS or Pop! OS. The people buying System76 hardware are buying it because it runs Ubuntu really well. So they either have to be really close in that Ubuntu lineage, or they're going to have to offer Ubuntu proper. Well, yeah, but as long as Ubuntu works on it, because the big question I have here, and I am not over in the States, so I, I don't really know many people who've got System76 machines, but if I bought one, the first thing I would do is wipe it and put Zubuntu on there. And a lot of people would put Arch or Fedora or whatever, because if it works really well with Ubuntu, then the chances are it's going to work with the other generally uh, that is that is almost universally true with some caveats system 76 bundles a ppa with their uh, machines and that ppa includes fixes and drivers that often make a system run better and there is some ways to get it on arch it's like i think there's a, a, something in the aur for it but if you've got a different ubuntu flavor like zubuntu like is what i would use then i presume i could add that ppa manually sure you could but then i don't i think you're beginning to fall outside the spectrum of system 76 customer not fully outside of it well that's that's the question that that's the question uh, am i outside of that or or not are, are how many of their customers really you know wipe it new can pave as soon as they get it from my conversations with both System76 and Dell, they are under the impression, probably based on support calls, that the vast majority leave the stock install. And surprising that both vendors said that to me when I asked them that question. Because, Joe, I was thinking the same thing. Like, that's what I do. I usually put something else on there. But they, at least in the terms of their support data show, that customers run what they ship. Well, that would be consistent with basically any other hardware that comes with any operating system, be it phones or computers. People who buy a Windows machine, they think it's broken because Windows is so slow. They don't even want to use the recovery partition, they don't even know there's a recovery partition. So people just want an appliance. But I, I just can't help but think that the kind of person who would buy a Linux machine would have a different mindset. But maybe I'm wrong. It might matter more in the future because this hardware is getting more sophisticated, more advanced, it has more specialized features in it like super high resolution screens, crazy great trackpads. Perhaps in the future it might have dual batteries and integrated LTE modems. I'm thinking of the Galago Pro. And these types of features might require more and more System 76's modifications. So you combine that with user application feedback they're getting from their customer, future hardware designs that they perhaps have on the roadmap that have more sophistication than ever, they might have just arrived at a place where they said, we're going to have to modify Ubuntu so much to make it work with our stuff that we should really just call it our own OS. And that might be something that's really a 2018 reality, but they've got to start the work in 2017. Well, yeah, and also they, they're kind of almost going for this Apple approach, aren't they? In theory, of control the hardware and the software, and then you're going to have a great experience. Yeah, and it does seem like if anybody was going to be able to integrate hardware and software, it would be a hardware vendor who's got a lot of experience tweaking the end result. Now, here is where I play a little devil's advocate. At the same time, System76 is trying to spin up a massive manufacturing effort, which is brand new to their company. They're also going to spin up an operating system? Don't call it a distribution. <laughs> and they're making it up, they're making it available to the general public. So it's not just an OS for their hardware, but it's an OS for quote unquote creators. This is two unbelievable, massive endeavors that I can't really think of any other companies besides one or two that have really pulled this off. One thing I heard you say on user error was that if they don't do this right, then it could be the beginning of the end for them. And then you kind of got sidetracked. And I'm really keen to know where you were going with that. 
It would really be the unfortunate combination of a series of events, delays in the hardware manufacturing process, so they have to continue to ship ODM hardware where they have to make compromises they're not happy with, and then an OS that isn't well-received by the community that doesn't gain a lot of brand traction, sorry to use these terms, but if it doesn't gain a lot of brand traction, they're going to be delivering slightly underwhelming hardware with an OS that nobody's really heard of, and that's a super marginalized position to be in. It's also at the same time, if if it's successful, would be a really great position to be in. So I can I can I can see their bold logic here. It's just extremely bold. And I have to be honest with you, the kind of improvement I would have liked to have seen as an 11 year customer of 76 are things that make using the machines long term even better. I'll give you a number one example. With the XPS line and a few others, Dell has now managed to ship firmware updates via GNOME Software Center, integrated right in with my Linux desktop. No more need for free DOS or booting into Windows to fix microcode issues. It's just right there in GNOME Software Center. It feels like an Apple-level integrated experience. I would love to see work done on that. I would love to see pressure applied to the upstream ODM. These kinds of things would have been more direct, real changes that would improve the existing immediate product line that would make me want to buy another computer in the short term. As it is right now, I mean, I'm, maybe I'm waiting until 2019, 2020 before I'm going to take another look at a System76 machine simply because now I'm going to want to wait to see where their hardware manufacturing goes and where Pop! OS goes. And it's going to take a few years for everything to mature. Yeah, I think that's all fair. But have you uh, had a look at this yet? At Pop! OS? Yeah. Yeah, just a bit. I tossed it in a VM yesterday. It's quite pretty, isn't it? It's a little loud. I find it to be a bit distracting, so I generally go with a more low-key icon theme. But other than that, I yeah, it's actually not bad. And what I really like is how they're working to take that theme and extend it to other applications like Telegram and maybe Slack to really make it all feel like it's one desktop. Yeah, and the extensions that they've chosen to use, I think, are ones that I would if I was forced to use GNOME. So it, it makes it more usable than the kind of stock Ubuntu GNOME. So... Yeah, I think they're going in the right direction with it, but it, we've just got to see what, what the community pushback is going to be because we're actually going to get a release, aren't we, around the same time as 17.10 comes mm-hmm. out in October. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll, we'll have to see how good that is. I could see it working out. If the community got behind it, if they could work with Canonical, become an official flavor, and they had the internal resources to pull it off, it could be one of the more interesting flavors of the Ubuntu desktop. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Well, speaking of the Ubuntu desktop, Will Cook has posted about easing the migration of Unity 7 users to Gnome Shell. Yeah, we mentioned last week they're separating out the Ubuntu desktop session and the Unity session, so you can have the new Gnome desktop and Unity 7 side by side. They've also done some work to improve the desktop launchers to make use of the new GNOME platform snap support, which is actually kind of neat. So they're going to have like full-fledged, fancy snap support in GNOME software which is going upstream, and they're continuing work on the live patch service that we've been talking about recently to integrate it into the Ubuntu desktop, and it now looks like the update manager utility is capable of displaying the current live patch status as well as the fixes that are available for installation or those that have already been applied, and they're working on a prototype API that'll just go fetch the latest information from the CVE database. So much for people like me saying that they were totally abandoning the desktop and not working on it anymore, eh? Yeah, that's a really nice feature to put in your desktop update manager, and it's probably going to spur a lot of adoption of the live patch service. Yeah, and it's good to see that this stuff is getting pushed upstream as well. So what we kind of speculated about that it was going to be good for Gnome uh, as a whole seems to be coming true already, and we haven't even seen a proper release yet. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. Go there to sign up for a free seven-day trial and support the show for a platform that has everything you need to learn and get hands-on experience with Linux topics from the really low-level stuff all the way up to the cloud stuff like Azure and AWS and OpenStack. If you, you know, actually, if you need to learn AWS from my personal experience, I will recommend Linux Academy. This was a game changer for me because when I started with trying to learn AWS, I burn through hours and hours of, of CPU time. With Linux Academy, they spin up the systems as you need them on demand. They have hands-on scenario-based labs that give you real experience and instructor mentoring when you need it, as well as a course scheduler that works with your busy schedule. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. So back when Canonical dropped the bombshell that they were killing Convergence and Unity and all that stuff, we had assumed that Mir was going to be 
the number one casualty of that because why do they need Mir anymore if they're going to go to Wayland uh, on Gnome and they're not going to work on the phones anymore? Well, it seems that we were wrong about that because they're heading towards a Mir 1.0 release, which is actually going to support Wayland. Yeah, it was just a flesh wound, Joe. I did a little digging before the show, and it looks like patches have been applied since the announcements, after the announcements, and it looks like, according to Alan, who's one of the long, not Alan Jude, but Alan uh, Griffiths, one of the longtime Mir developers, says that Mir 0.27 is coming soon with a lot of work-in-progress features that were baking prior to Canonical shifting their desktop focus. They're also talking about adding Wayland support, like you were saying, and this could be huge for different desktops because Mir might just be about to become a compositor that speaks Wayland. Yeah, and that means that potentially Mate might be able to take advantage of that and not have to either roll their own or rely on Mutter. If this sounds a little crazy, well, these are the kind of things that open source enthusiasts come up with when they're all together in the same room. They've been at a snappy sprint in Canonical's London office, and they've been chatting about Flatpak and Snap integrations with existing GNOME software and stuff. But this came up on the sidelines, and the idea really here was... It would take less work to add Wayland support to Mir than it would to move Mate over to Mutter or to build uh, uh, Wayland support into uh, Marco, its compositor. To be honest, this has sort of been coming for a little while. They first moved over to GTK3, but after that, what comes next? High DPI came, then it becomes Wayland support time. This is really where they're up against a wall, and Wimpy says it perfectly. Mr. Wimpress says that... Matei is a very small team with extremely constrained time. Implementing Wayland directly is, at our current development velocity, several years away, in his opinion. He then goes on to say, Mir could provide us a fast path to supporting Wayland. We should explore it, and possibly other desktops without Wayland support as well, like maybe Joe's beloved XFCE. Well, whatever makes it work. The last thing I expected to come to XFCE's rescue is Mir, but yeah, if it happens, it happens. Great. If it means that XFCE can stay relevant and use modern technology, then I'm I'm well up for it. I want to be clear about this point because I've read a lot of negative feedback about this story on the internet already. If we blow this as a community, we are guaranteed in for a bumpy ride with the transition to Wayland. Unless, unless some display server magician shows up and writes magic code for every open source desktop that crops up under the sun that's going to need to speak Wayland, Unless that happens, we're either going to have a massive consolidation of desktops once everybody switches over to Wayland, and it's only going to be the top projects that can make it work, or we need a common API for all these other projects to take advantage of, like Mir, that can do the hard, heavy lifting of talking to Wayland and then provide them a versioned API set that they can just write their desktop to. But do you think that there's going to be a bit of pushback against it? There already is. Well, do you think it's going to be continued because it's a canonical not invented here type deal. Yes, definitely. Canonical could make things easier on themselves by putting everything on GitHub, by taking Launchpad out of it. I don't know if that's a reality. I don't know if that's possible. And also, that CLA has to be taken out of the picture as well for people to really double down on this. Maybe that can happen. Maybe it mostly already has. I don't know. Canonical seems to love the CLA, though, don't they? (laughs) (laughs) Well, it just makes things easier if you want to relicense and stuff. Yeah, you're absolutely right. However, if you read Alan's blog, they talk about refocusing the project for quote-unquote Ubuntu Core and separating the Android stuff out as its own project. That might be lining it up for something like pulling out the CLA, putting it up on GitHub. Mm, I'm not convinced, really. Um, I hope so. I, I hope it happens, but I just don't think it will. Yes, I am being optimistic. I'm hopeful that we can pull this off, or we have a bunch of magic coders that show up all of a sudden and can write perfect compositors for all these open source desktops. Yeah, I think we should have seen this coming, though, you know, because more or less straight away after they made the announcement, they said that they were going to continue Mir for the IoT stuff. And where the IoT needs a display, then it just makes sense that you're going to have Mir and Wayland. Yeah, so I think the takeaway from this story, if you hear this floating around on the internet, this isn't a Wayland competitor. This is about making Mir work with Wayland. Yeah, it's about them actually using a standard for once rather than completely writing their own. Yeah. Speaking of going at their own, Intel has a bit of a bug in their Skylake and Kaby Lake 6th and 7th gen CPUs. Yeah, one of which I've got in this laptop that I'm using to speak to you now. Yeah, I've got one. In the, I think I've got one <laughs> in one of my machines, too. Watch out, Joe. It could dangerously misbehave. 
Well, it hasn't yet, and I only installed the microcode fix today, um, and I've not had any problems. I think that this has been a little bit overblown. This actually came out um, around the time we recorded this time last week, but we didn't cover it because the details were a bit sketchy at that point. But now, after a week to digest it, I think that it's been a little bit overblown, really, because I think it's a very specific set of circumstances that are going to trigger this bug. Yeah, not only is it certain circumstances, but they have to be under complex microarchitectural conditions, as Intel puts it, where this bug can only happen when both the logical processor on the same physical processors are active. Whatever that means, it's their way of trying to say it's really hard to pull this off. And I, I buy it. Because honestly, these some of these products have been in the market for a couple of years now, and we're just now coming across this. There's an interesting conundrum here, though, because a lot of Linux advocates, a lot of open source advocates out there, are now all of a sudden in a position where they kind of need that nasty microcode. That's what I find fascinating about this story. Yeah, and if you're running a pragmatic distro like Ubuntu, for example, it's very easy to get this microcode and, and run it at boot. And then you don't have to go into your BIOS or EFI and disable hyperthreading. Which, uh, well, that's the question for you. Did you disable hyperthreading when you heard about this, or did no. you just risk it? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna risk it, Joe. I'm just gonna go for it. And then what I think I'll do is, in a few weeks, I'll check in on my motherboard's website and uh, vendor's website and see if they have a BIOS update for my system, and I'll probably fix it that way. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not hugely happy about running proprietary code, but. I thought I'd better do it anyway, just to be safe. But the problem with Debian, and that's why it it came out of Debian that we realized this was a problem, is that Debian is not, they, they're not very happy about shipping proprietary code, are they? And they're not happy about facilitating it. And the microcode is not installed by default on a Debian installation either. It's, it's in the repo, but it's not by default. Yeah, and it's not only Linux users who are affected by this. It's It's a hardware problem, so it's not, exclusive to the Linux community. You could be forgiven for seeing it that way because it's associated with Debian. People first thought it was just a Debian problem, then, oh, it's a Linux problem. Well, no, hang on. This has been a problem for Windows and Mac OS as well, and presumably BSD even. I got a little spooked when I started reading deeper and deeper into the story and started hearing from people that used to work at Intel, and they said, you have no idea. There are so many bugs in these CPUs now because they're so complex. What you hear about is just the tip of the iceberg. And I was like, okay, that's going to make me neurotic. If I go any further, I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> yeah, not to mention the potential backdoors and stuff. Yeah, it's, it's not a pretty picture. Um, but uh, it's what we have for today, at least. And, you know, I probably will update just because I run my recording systems with these processors. And, you know, I want to do everything I can to make them as stable as possible. And thankfully, microcode package updates are available for Linux. If you're on Windows 10, you're going to be waiting a little bit. Yeah, hang on. So you want it to be as stable as possible and you're still using GNOME? Your face, Joe, your face. I did, an, <laughs> I did some updates and so far it at least isn't crashing in, uh, three times a day anymore. I am still going to move off. I've actually, I've actually decided, I think after my conversation... Um, with uh, Dustin, I, I think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna do Ubuntu 16.04 LTS with Live Patch on the broadcast machine. Oh, right. Yeah. Now it's just waiting for me to get off my butt and reload that system. But it's such a. It's like such a tight Jack Bauer window I have to work in because there's only so much time before we're live again. <laughs> so you gotta you gotta reload the system and not miss any of your broadcast config. Is 16.04 going to be new enough for you to get the software you need, though? Oh, I the, the versions. I hadn't really checked yet, so it's something I got to look into. I before I even do it, I'm gonna. I would set up a whole nother rig and try it all there and validate the config before I actually put it in production. So I don't know. I'm hopeful. I hear there's these wonderful things called PPAs. So I was gonna say, P you love a PPA, <laughs> not. <laughs> Maybe I can get a flat pack. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe even a snap. Yeah, yeah, you never know. I'd take it, actually. Could be a good way to distribute OBS. Are you listening, OBS Project? Make it happen. <laughs> All right, well, that brings us to the end of this week's episode. You can check out linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for all the ways to get in touch. Yeah, we'll be back next Monday with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. I'm at Chris LAS. I'm at Joe Rissington. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. See you later.